There are many definitions of what it means to be rich, and in today's Rich Habits, Poor Habits podcast that I do once a month with Tom Cawley, we're going to discuss the number one factor that makes poor people rich. But before we do, I'd like to give you some of my thoughts, because being rich, in my mind anyway, is more a state of mind than a dollar amount. Truthfully, the rich can be poor and the poor can be rich. For example, I remember... Earlier this year, Pam and I went on our cruise to the west coast of Africa and there were some very, very poor families there living in third world countries, but they lovingly shared a small piece of bread and that made that family rich. On the other hand, I bet you there's lots of family of five who are living in a 12-bedroom mansion somewhere who are fighting over the unlimited first-class feast they've got over their table. So... Being rich is really more about having what you want and being able to enjoy your wealth. I know some people put 100 hours into work every week and completely neglect their families in the process. Others focus on their families so much that they really never get busy with their work because of their other obligations. Obviously, you need a sense of balance about getting rich. And true wealth to me isn't just about money or how many properties you've got or how many shares you've got. You've actually got to be able to have your health. If you haven't got your health, then all the rest doesn't work too well, does it? You've got to have time to enjoy and appreciate it. You've got to have somebody to love and somebody to love you to be truly wealthy. You've got to have the ability to give back to the community and contribute. You've got to have spirituality. You've got to be able to grow and learn. So true wealth is a lot more than about how many properties you've got. And I thought I'd just share that with you because in these podcasts I talk a lot about money, but I also want to explain that money, wealth, isn't a zero-sum game. So just because I'm wealthy and have a big property portfolio doesn't stop you from becoming wealthy. But that's the excuse a lot of people are giving, or maybe excuse they're giving because they haven't become wealthy. They believe that the rich can only become rich at the expense of others. And as I said, that's sometimes called a zero-sum game because they believe that uh, just like tennis, where one player loses, another one wins. But it doesn't work that way. In fact, I remember reading something, um, a little saying, saying, uh, the poor man said with a twitch, were I not poor, you wouldn't be rich. That's really not true. I know the thinking is very common, but it's fundamentally wrong. Well, a good example of that is the incredible development in China over the last four decades. At no other point in history have so many people escaped bitter poverty in such a short time as in China. According to the World Bank figures, the percentage of extremely poor people in China in 1981 was 88.3% of their population. By 1990, it had fallen to 66.2% of the population. In 2015, only 0.7%, less than 1% of the Chinese population, were living in extreme poverty. In other words, during this period of four decades, the number of poor people in China fell from 87 million to less than 10 million. And it wasn't at the expense of others. So I guess what I'm trying to point out is you can become rich. You've heard in Average Habits, Poor Habits podcast before that becoming wealthy in the countries where you're listening to this is very likely, is very possible. If you get more rich habits and fewer poor habits. We're going to discuss that in today's show. By the way, it's one of the things we discuss at length at Wealth Retreat, and Tom Corley's is coming to Australia in June to be at my 2020 Wealth Retreat. And if you want to catch up with Tom Corley, me, and a range of other very successful business people, entrepreneurs, and investors, not just in the faculty, but that you're going to be living with for five days, why not go to wealthretreat.com.au, find out all about it, and By the way, you can't book in. It's an invitation-only event, but I'd love to have a chat with you. So go to wealthretreat.com.au, fill in your registration of interest. I'll get back to you personally, have a chat with you, and see if it would suit you and if you'd suit the Wealth Retreat community. Anyway, after that really long introduction, welcome to today's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. 
Now here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. What's the number one factor that makes poor people rich? Now, I bet you want to know that. I think most people want to know that. The reality is that where most people are living who are listening to this podcast today, there is the ability to rise from whatever level of wealth you are to at least the next level, but quite a few levels up. Every day in the United States, in Australia, in most Western countries, new people become millionaires, multimillionaires. So what makes those rise up and what keeps the balance of uh, the working class people, uh, and again, this is not a judge of people, but what keeps them uh, at a level of more poverty. That's what I want to discuss today with the co-author of my best-selling book, Rich Habits, Poor Habits, Tom Corley. Welcome, Tom. Hey, Michael. It's good to see you. Now, I know many, many years ago, you conducted the Rich Habits study where you can uh, chatted with 177 self-made millionaires. In other words, people who did it themselves who didn't inherit it. So let me be blunt. Let's get down to it. What was the number one factor that helped them shake off the change of poverty and become wealthy? Yeah. Uh, what I discovered in my research was that they changed their habits. See, when you're, when you're raised in a poor household, Michael, you pick up Habits spread like a virus throughout your social networks. That's not Tom Corley talking. That's about five different studies. One by Nicholas Christakis. He, that's probably the most famous one. But what he found is that your inner circle, which is predominantly your parents when you're young, uh, they instill certain habits that you take with you into your adult years, right? So when you become an adult and if you have the habits, the poor habits that you were raised with, you know, at some point, usually it's around 35, 40 years old when you've got a couple of kids, a wife and a mortgage, and you're scratching your head and you're saying, why why am I eking out a living? Why can't I make it in life? Well, the reason I found it from my research is it's your habits, things that you might not even be aware of, your daily habits. So you've got to change your habits if you want to change your life. Well, many years ago, I remember reading Wallace Wattle's great book, The Science of Getting Rich, and more recently, T. Harv Eckers wrote The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, where they said much the same. Your thoughts lead to your feelings, your feelings lead to your actions, your actions lead to your results. In other words, your inside world um, is reflected in, in the outside world. And anyone who's been listening to our podcast, watching our videos, reading your blogs on your website or on my, my website knows a lot about the habits we've been talking about. So rather than going into those at the moment, what I'd like to ask you is, is there a shortcut? Is there a simple way to change your habits? Because we all have some good habits and some poor habits. Yeah, so that's the that's the beauty of my research. Uh, I think the, you know, one of the things that uh, it's easy for me to sit back and you advising and mentoring people say, well, you got to change your habits. Well, that's great. I've got to grow six inches taller. That's not going to happen. Well, guess what? I we have shortcuts for you uh, on how to change your habits. One of them is something called habit merging. It's actually I'm trying to let me explain it this way. A habit is a synapse, a brain synapse. It's a bunch of neurons inside the brain that are all connected uh, together, right? So it's like a chain, a linked chain. Well, uh, or think of it, maybe a better metaphor is a railroad cars, a bunch of railroad cars. So you have this synapse, these railroad cars. Now uh, you say to your brain, hey, I want to change my habits. Well, your brain puts up a big fight because that means it's going to require an enormous amount of glucose fuel, brain fuel, which the brain is very je jealously preserves. It doesn't like to use brain fuel. So it says, no, we don't want you to change your habits. That's why it's so hard to change a habit. We go back and we fall back on our bad habits. Well, but I found through habit merging, you can actually change a habit instantaneously, almost immediately. So think about, for example, that rail, railroad cars. Uh, and imagine you open one of the railroad cars and you put in a new habit into that railroad car. Well, the brain's not going to put up a fight. It's going to say, hey, I don't even know what's going on here. I, I'm not recognizing any any changes in, in brain synapse. 
Uh, so what I did to give you an example, one of the things that I do every morning is I have a cup of coffee. The first thing I get, get into my office and I have a cup of coffee. Well, my best friend, Bill King, uh, he said, hey, Tom, he's 10 years older than me. He's Irish like I am. And he said, you know, we're Irish. Uh, we have this process, we have uh, urinary tract infections is, is inherent in the Irish. And he had horrible urinary tract infections. So he said, you have to drink water every day. You got to drink at least two 12 ounces uh, of water. And I said, Bill, I'm, ha- I'm having a hard time uh, forging that habit. I keep forgetting. Uh, so you know what I did, Michael? I took my coffee cup, which was already a habit. I didn't need any reminding of that. I put it on our water cooler. And would you, you wouldn't believe it, but within three days, I had a new joint habit. So I said, this is amazing. I did the same thing. I, I was doing the Stairmaster a lot. I usually r- run on a treadmill or a Stairmaster. Well, uh, I that's a habit. I do it every day. I don't even have to think about it. It's the first thing I do. Uh, I said, well, I want to read more. So I, I wanted to read more books. And so I put a book. I created this contraption on my Stairmaster where I could actually put a book on my Stairmaster and read it while I'm doing my Stairmaster. Tom, the problem is that these habits are at an unconscious level. What's happening is all day you're going around doing things at an unconscious level, but that's a shortcut the brain takes so that you don't get overwhelmed. That's right. You know, you know, it's habits require in order to forge a habit, it takes anywhere from 18 to 254 days, the traditional way. And that requires willpower and discipline. And so you have to be really wanting to change something very badly. Uh, But if you know the shortcuts to habit change, then it doesn't have to be hard work. And you can actually fool your brain. You can trick your brain into forging habits without it putting up a fight because the fight it's putting up is really one of fuel conservation. It just does not want to expend fuel, it needs the glucose to run all of its other operations. So if you add a habit to it, it puts the brain a little bit in overload. So if you know, the brain tries to say, hey, go back to the old habit, we don't want any new habits. Okay. Another way to forge new habits is who you hang around with. We've often heard it said that you're the average of the, the five people you're closest with. So if you hang around with people who uh, run every morning, you're more likely to be a, a fitter person. If you hang around with people who ride bikes and wear lycra, and uh, you, you're more likely to be like that. Uh, that's important, isn't it? Yeah, it's very important. It's another shortcut to habit change. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's uh, the, your habits habits spread like a virus throughout your social networks. So if you're hanging out around uh, a new group of people and uh, you're going to be hanging around, like let's say you get a new job. Uh, Now you've got a whole new set of people that you're hanging around. Well, you're going to adopt some of their habits. Whether you know it or not, you are going to adopt some of their habits. So let's say uh, you want to forge certain habits. Well, the smart people, the self-made millionaires in my study, what they did is they found people who had those habits and they said, I'm going to hang around those people. I'm just going to, maybe they, they reside in a nonprofit, maybe they're at a gym, uh, but they're at in some location, some environment. So the, the self-made millionaires in my study said, I want these habits. These are the people that have them. I'm going to start associating with those people. And it makes it so much easier because, you know, you there's this thing that we have as human beings it's just it's just human nature we want to follow the herd we want to do what other people are doing we don't want to stand out uh, so much and so when we're in a group we want to really become part of that group by mimicking them we have mirror neurons mirror neurons allow us to mimic the behaviors of others so it's just human nature it's physiology when you have a new group of people, you're going to forge their habits uh, because of the physiology, the way the brain works. So what you've really got to do is, first of all, 
understand that you're driving around with one foot on the gas or the accelerator, as we say in Australia, and one on the brake. You've got some rich habits that are helping you get to where you want to go financially and in your goals in life and some poor habits that are holding you back. And we've got to try and get rid of some of those poor habits. So you habit stack, you associate with other people, you change your environment. But I think, Tom, some people get themselves into trouble because they, they want to do it all at once. Isn't it better to start small? Oh, that's the, that is one of the the other shortcuts. I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, you know, um, a good example is let's say you want to start exercising. You want to run. You want to jog. You look out and you say, "Oh my gosh, you know, I've got to lose weight, so I've got to go out and run thirty to forty minutes a day. I've got to I've got to walk an hour a day." Well, that's the wrong approach. So, what you should be telling yourself is, "No, I'm not going to worry about." running 30 minutes a day or walking an hour a day or or spending an enormous amount of time. My goal is just five minutes. Five minutes is all I'm going to commit to. And if you commit, even if it's reading a book, you want to learn more and you want to become more knowledgeable. Don't try and stuff, you know, an hour into your, your day of reading. Do five minutes. Start small. Here's the reason why it works. Because even though it's only five minutes, the same neurons are firing every fi- every day for five minutes. So when the, that neural sy- synapse, uh, every day that you engage in that small five-minute habit, those neurons get stronger and stronger, and that connection, that those the, the chain, the links, uh, chain link grows stronger every day. Uh, and so na- then you could say, well, I'm going to amp it up to 10 minutes. I'm going to amp it up to 15 minutes. Your brain doesn't put up a fight because the neurons are already, the infrastructure is already in place. Now, Tom, does that work in reverse? If you want to get rid of bad habits, do you do it all at once or do you do it slowly, slowly? Yo, it's the same concept. You have to do it slowly. So the perfect example is cigarette smokers, right? If you want to stop smoking cigarettes, how many people have tried cold turkey? They just said, I'm, I'm not going to smoke anymore. Uh, probably close to about 95% of them wind up smoking cigarettes again. The smart ones, uh, they say, you know, I'm going to limit myself to 10 cigarettes a day. And then that's for like a month. And then the next month, it's down to, say, seven cigarettes a day. And then the next month, it's four. And then the next month, it's three, then two. And then maybe you just say, you know what? I'm going to keep smoking, but I'm going to smoke two cigarettes a day, one in the morning and one at night. Well, that's okay. I mean, it's not the best thing for your health, but it certainly is a lot better than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. You wean yourself off of bad habits, just like you wean yourself onto good habits. What I've found, Tom, is small changes give you momentum. They increase your confidence. You feel good about it. So then you take on something a little bit bigger and a bit bigger, and eventually uh, you, you can maintain that. The other thing I've found useful is actually to schedule your new habits, to have a to-do list, to set aside time, to whether it's to read or to exercise. It's got to be in your calendar. Otherwise, other things are going to creep in. Yeah, so so we all are now attached to our phones, right? Our iPhones and our Droids or whatever. Um, what I have set up uh, through Outlook is I put reminders on there, right? Especially in the beginning of my, my Rich Habits research, I would have to put on my calendar, you know, remember to call so-and-so because I needed to ask them questions about my the Rich Habits and the Poor Habits. And so I would schedule it every day on outlook and you can build into your calendar whatever it is which which then gets linked to your phone you can build into that goal what i call daily goal habits so if you have you're pursuing a dream you're gonna in order to realize that dream you're gonna need to accomplish certain goals right so uh build into your calendar certain goal habits that you need to accomplish every day and then it'll remind you through your phone and you'll say oh yeah i've got to I got to make sure I got to make those hello calls, those happy birthday calls, those life event calls. I've got a, you know, a meeting this week with a, a nonprofit because I want to get on the board there so I can meet influencers so I can get a better job or uh, more clients or whatever. You know, whatever the rich habit is that you're trying to accomplish, put, put it on your calendar and automate it. Just remember, what we're talking about today is the number one factor that makes poor people rich. We've found that they change their habits. What Tom and I are working through is the idea that there are shortcuts to make it easy to change your habits. And we've assumed that you understand about what 
some of the rich habits are and some of the poor habits. But if you're not familiar with this, why not go to richhabitspoorhabits.com where you're going to be able to find out about our top-selling book that's been translated into four languages that's selling around the world, uh, that excerpts of it are being um, uh, written up in a lot of business magazines. And it's based on Tom's Rich Habits study and on my mentoring of over 2,500 successful and not so successful people. And the concept is that we have rich habits, we have poor habits, and over time, we want to eliminate many of the poor habits and increase our number of rich habits. Go to richhabitspoorhabits.com, get your own copy of the book. You can find it on Amazon, get it on Kindle. It's available all over the world online on the internet and in many good bookstores. Tom, I know you and I are very proud of that work, but I think we are more excited by the emails that we get from people who've listened to these podcasts followed our blogs, and actually changed their lives. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, so I, I wish I wish I could show everybody the um, the folder that I've been keeping on the testimonials, the emails that I get from people. Um, it's probably three inches thick now. But one of the, the ones that stands out, and, and, and it's probably the reason why I, uh, it gives me motivation every day, this woman who I helped mentor via email, she was one of my fans, one of the Rich Habits fans, and uh, she she was trying to save money. She, that, she wanted to adopt that rich habit of putting away 10% of her income. So she did that for about a year, maybe a year and a half, and she, she sent me a LinkedIn comment. She said, I just wanted to thank you for saving my daughter's life. And I was like, what the heck is this about? And I read through it, and what she did was she had saved uh, – she lived in a different country, like not – not in the United States or Australia, but in a country that didn't have the best health care uh, system. And she had, in, in that country, her daughter had gotten brain cancer. And in that country, in order to get the best doctors, the specialists, uh, you had to have money. So you ha- in her case, she needed $1,500. And she had saved up the $1,500 by following my rich, 10% rich habit. And when her daughter got cancer, brain cancer, uh, she was able to give the doctors, the specialists, $1,500, and her daughter you know, survived and is now thriving, and she just wanted to thank me. And so we get these kind – they're not, nothing like that, saving a life, but you know, we get, hey, my, my life has improved. I'm happier. I'm healthier. I get those all the time. Uh, people lost weight or whatever. Uh, I've, you know, hey, I'm doing much better. I got a promotion. There's one – a uh, guy sent me an email that was following my rich habits and uh, he got he uh, picked up three new clients in a month just by the volunteering rich habit, right? So I'm like, oh, I got to save these. These are great. They work, Michael. You know, we wouldn't be doing this if, the, if they didn't work, right? So I think the message is if other people can do it, you can do it. So thank you, Tom, for spending some time again on our monthly Rich Habits, Poor Habits podcast. And for the listeners, This is gold. It actually does work. It has changed people's lives, sometimes to a small degree, sometimes to a larger degree. But if you're not satisfied where you are, look in the mirror, see what's going on, because the outside world isn't going to change. Luck isn't going to fall upon you. It's meant to be hard. If it wasn't hard, the rewards wouldn't be so great. So look at your habits and one by one, start adopting some more rich habits and slowly getting rid of some of your poor habits. Thanks so much for your time again, Tom. Great to be talking to you, Michael. Thank you. Well, you learned a little bit more about why the rich get richer and how you can become one of them. Now, if you want to immerse yourself in this, if you'd love for five days to get together with a group of already successful business people, entrepreneurs and investors, why not join me at Wealth Retreat 2020 on the Gold Coast on the 6th to the 10th of June. Now, while it's for already successful business people, entrepreneurs and investors, please don't count yourself out because every year we 
encourage a couple of people who are still working their way up the rung to come there. That's the opportunity I would have loved to have. So I offer that to a couple of people every year as well. So go to wealthretreat.com.au. There'll be a link in the show notes. Find out about it. Register your interest. Then I'll have a one-on-one chat with you to make sure it's suitable, that you'd get benefit, that you'd be a good, good fit with the community. And I'd love to work more closely with you You'll also be able to see Don Corley. He'll be there, Dr. Andrew Wilson, and a great group of business, property, tax, and finance experts living together for five days to help you plan the next five years of your life. That's really what the theme of Wealth Retreat is, where you're going to be in five years' time. Now, you can get more of Tom Corley regularly at propertyupdate.com.au, my regular newsletter, and of course, in his Rich Habits, Poor Habits blog and i'll have a link to that in the show notes of course twice a week i'll be back with you on this podcast but if you got some benefit from it share it with somebody else tell somebody about it leave us a review and i look forward to catching up with you regularly on all the social media channels and i'll be back again real soon with this podcast but in the meantime have a great week make it a great week Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?